<laughs> okay, then I think we'll, uh, we'll start. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to this uh, seminar on the EU and Central Asia. My name is Panile Riki and I'm a senior researcher here at NUPI, working on the, in the research group on European studies. And I will be chairing this uh, meeting. I would also like to say that this uh, seminar is uh, part of a series of seminars on European issues that we initiated at NUPI last year and which is funded by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Central Asia is important for the EU and also for Norway. It is a region rich on energy, re energy resources that the EU needs. It may function as a bridge between Europe, Asia, Russia and the Middle East. And finally, security and stability in this region is important for the EU. But this region is not covered by the European Union neighborhood policy. The enlargement process and the inclusion of South Caucasus in the ENP has brought this region closer to the EU. As we will hear in a moment, the EU has also increased its representation in this region after the establishment of the European External Action Service. The EU has also adopted a Central Asia strategy in 2007, and the EU is increasingly given priority to this region. The objectives of EU strategy is in fact very similar to the objectives of the European neighborhood policy. This to facilitate the democracy promotion, respect for human rights, good governance, uh, the rule of, uh, and the rule of law, uh, environmental protection, border control, security and stability, and so on. The question, of course, is whether the EU manages to exercise this kind of soft power efficiently in this region. Do it have the right tools? Do it have the necessary recognition in the region? And do the EU and its member states have the necessary political will, especially now, in a time of economic crisis and austerity. <coughs> this is a topic that we are interested in here at NUPI, both in the research group, group on Russia, Asia, and the Arctic, who has organized this seminar, and in the research group on European studies, where I am working. Researchers in both groups are also taking part in a, an application to the EU, which focuses on the relationship between democracy and security in the Caucasus, and the role of the EU in this neighboring region to Central Asia. So hopefully we will be able to work more on these issues. Due to this interest, it is therefore a great pleasure for me to introduce the, the three speakers for today. They all have a great competence in, on both Central Asia and the EU. They will t give us a 15 minute talk each about various aspects of the relationship between the EU and Central Asia. <coughs> First, we have Dr. Indra Øverland, who is the head of the Russian, Eurasian and Arctic Research Group here at NUPI, and he will talk about EU's diplomatic presence in Central Asia. Then we have uh, Neil, Dr. Neil Melvin, who is director of the Armed Conflict and Conflict Management Program at CIPRI in Stockholm. And uh, he, he, will talk, he will give a talk on whether or not the EU can act strategically in Central Asia. And finally, Dr. Jos Bonstra, who is head of the EU Central Asia Monitoring Program at FRIDE in Madrid. And he is going to talk about uh, the EU approach to the development security nexus in Central Asia. We will, I think we will take the three presentations in a row, but there will be a time for one or two questions after each <coughs> presentation. But if you do not have the time to post a question after the, the, the presentation, there will be a second chance after the last speaker. So first of all, we will start with Indra Øvland, who is going to give us an overview of the EU's diplomatic presence in the region. So Indra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pernilla. Nice to see you all here today. Uh, this presentation is based on a research project uh, which is carried out in close cooperation with Christian Gerde, who is sitting here somewhere, and Christian Fiesta, who couldn't be here today, unfortunately. And this is very much uh, work in progress. Um, we have a lot of data, but we don't have very many conclusions yet, so we're hoping that you will help us draw some conclusions or give us some ideas for further analysis uh, today, and maybe some corrections also. <clears throat> so what we have done is an empirical mapping of Europe's diplomatic presence in Central Asia, which is the focus of the seminar, and the South Caucasus. So in this presentation, I'm also talking a little bit about the South Caucasus. We have tried to work out the who, when, where of diplomacy in this region. So basically, which countries in Europe have 
uh, diplomats in which countries at what times, and trying to see some, some trends over time. And the reason for this endeavor, the motivations for this, for this work, um, are manifold. The main thing was that we discovered that there is a surprising lack of information about diplomats in the world. You'd think that diplomacy, as one of the central aspects of international affairs, there would be quite a lot of information about it, about how many diplomats there are from different countries in different countries, other different countries. Uh, in fact, there isn't. There are few uh, studies. Um, Brussels and Washington are very open about uh, which countries have diplomats there. Uh, but in most other places, uh, there isn't as much openness. There are some big data sets, but they mostly dismeasure where there is an embassy, perhaps whether it is represented by an ambassador or first secretary and so on, the kind of top level. But since most big countries have embassies in most other countries, a lot of those data don't say a lot. So when you get into the more detail, there's really, this is a really big hole, uh, information hole, that we're trying to make a small contribution to filling. And we have created a data set which, which we will put online and make freely available for anybody to use. And we think that this data set may be helpful for some of the analysis that's already has been carried out, is being carried out, about the impact of the EU in this part of the world. And that analysis is often quite qualitative, focused on case studies, uh, quite narrow, quite in-depth, but lacks a bit of overview and often could maybe need a, one or two more factual pillars to rest on. So we're aiming to, to contribute that. It's also, we think this, these data are also interesting in light of the evolving relationship and balance between bilateral EU diplomatic representations, this is the, the embassies of the EU member countries, and the emerging role um, of the EU delegations, in particular in light of the creation of the European External Action Service two or three years ago. <clears throat> and of course, from a Norwegian perspective, I bore our foreign guests a little bit with this, we think this slightly remote topic also has some interest. <clears throat> the EU is a very big actor in this region, as we're going to see. And this is a region where Norway has two embassies, but relatively few fa staff. So we have two embassies, but quite uh, small ones. Norway is a part of Europe, but not a part of the EU. The EU is a natural partner, interlocutor, in many areas, in some areas, we are actually part of EU uh, systems, like the Schengen <coughs> system. Um, so from a Norwegian perspective, it's interesting to understand better how the EU's diplomatic representation is involving in general and <coughs> exemplified by the case of, of this part of the world. Also, of course, this region is an important energy region. It's an important supplier to the same markets that Norwegian oil and gas go to. And it's a region in which Norwegian companies are investing and trying to invest. So that also gives the region a particular interest from a Norwegian perspective. So how have we done this? It's, the output is kind of simple. The, the effort to get it done was, is, um, was is, is surprisingly laborious, more than we expected. Uh, we have actually had 16 people directly involved in gathering the data, <coughs> operating in 10 different countries, and we've contacted 104 institutions in order to try to get information about diplomats at different times. We've carried out extensive internet searches, sent emails, a lot of emails, faxes, paper letters, made a lot of telephone calls, and we visited institutions in person in different countries, trying to twist people's arm to get them to give us uh, information, the information we're looking for. So this also helps explain why these data are so scarce in the first place globally. It's, it's surprisingly find out to f difficult to find out such simple things. 
And we've, so we've, we've been harvesting this data and putting them into large Excel sheets, which you see an example of here. <coughs> You're not supposed to read this, it's just for exemplification. Um, and these are then joined together uh, to make some graphs, which I'll be showing you on the next slides. But before I show you the actual data, a, f a few caveats are in place. It is, it has been a challenge to get all the people supplying us with information to, sup to use consistent classifications of what is a diplomat. So we've been working quite hard at this, we get numbers, we bounce them back and say, so what do you really mean? So we try to land on the kind of a straightforward uh, definition, diplomat is somebody with diplomatic immunity, but not their spouse and family, um, but not only ambassador, first secretary, and so on, but also other staff who have diplomatic Im immunity who are sent from the home country to a diplomatic mission, uh, but not local staff. So that's a quick kind of whiz through it. <clears throat> we think we've managed to systemize the data reasonably consistently around this, but it's, it's a continuing challenge. And another thing is that on some data points, we haven't managed to get information. So some places we've had to uh, extrapolate, to make guesses based on other data. And very often we'd get contradictory data and then we've triangulated. We use different sources to work out what we think is the most <coughs> probable number. So this is a, a data set consisting of estimates rather than facts. But at the same time, we think it says quite a lot about developments in diplomacy in the region. So this simple graph <clears throat> shows that this is just the total number of European diplomats of any hue in Central Asia and the South Caucasus from 1991 till today. And what it shows is that there has been a very steep, virtually linear growth in the European uh, diplomatic presence in the region. Another interesting thing, which we will see again on the next slides, but we can spot immediately, is that you see after 2000, 2003, there's no jump. So Afghanistan, the operation in Afghanistan, which many European countries are involved, doesn't, as far as we can see here, doesn't seem to have had much of an impact. Of course, you could hypothesize that perhaps the graph would have dropped off if it hadn't been for Afghanistan. We don't know that, at least. The graph continues linearly. These two lines represent Central Asia, on top and South Caucasus on bottom. What they show is that relative to the size, South Caucasus is over uh, diplomatized. It's only three countries versus five and the countries are much smaller in terms of population and area and in terms of the size of the economies. And still they have almost as many diplomats there from Europe as from Central Asia. A Couple of possible obvious reasons are one, they're closer um, and two, uh, the South Caucasus is seen as a, as a geopolitical uh, bottleneck of importance for Europe. <clears throat> it's also interesting to note that at the, at the very end of the graphs, from about 2010, Central Asia one continues upwards, South Caucasus seems to turn down. That's in, within the margin of error of our study, and it's also too short time to say much. But it's interesting to conjecture whether possibly Central Asia may be taking more of a, more be gaining in presence in the future. It's something to look out for in the future. At least Norway set up its embassy in Kazakhstan, its first one in Central Asia in 2010, so that would point in that direction where Europe is expanding uh, eastwards. So this is the presence of European diplomats in each of the eight countries in the region. What we see is that Kazakhstan is clearly the most diplomatically focused and interesting or important country in the region for the European countries <clears throat> overall. Georgia, which is the second line from the top, is clearly the most overrepresented country in relation to size of area, population, and economy. Very strong European representation. And finally, Uzbekistan, compared to its size, almost 30 million people now, <clears throat> is the most underrepresented country. Not a lot to focus on it, again. Also interesting to see that after the Andijan events, 2005, 
which involved quite a large number of people in Uzbekistan being killed, uh, and um, after which Uzbekistan was subject to sanctions from the EU and from also more broadly internationally. There isn't any uh, noticeable change in the trend in diplomatic representation in Uzbekistan. So it wasn't like people were, the European countries were, were withdrawing their diplomats, as far as we can see from our data, at least. <clears throat> this graph shows the upper line is the number of the total number of diplomats in all bilateral embassies, French embassy, German embassy, Polish embassy, and so on, in this part of the world. The red graph on the bottom is the number of diplomats, total number of diplomats working for the EU delegation. So this is the multilateral or federal or union, if you so wish, joint representation or office <coughs> missions in the region. And what we see is to some extent what we expected. There are a lot more bilateral diplomats than multilateral, if you allow those terms. But this impression has some modifications. First of all, we see again, the last three or so years, the number of bilateral diplomats seems to be tapering off, whereas the number of uh, um, EU delegation diplomats seems to be rising more steeply. The European Action Service came, uh, External Action Service came on, it was created in 2010, I believe. So it's interesting again to look, it will be interesting in the future to see if this is some more long-term trend that was started by the establishment of the External Action Service. It's a bit early to say that, but it's an, an interesting question to look at in the future. <clears throat> and if you look at the situation in 2012, 16% of the European diplomats in the region are representing the EU as a whole, rather than uh, individual member countries. Again, this is more than we thought. Our kind of working hypothesis was that the consensus, consensus seems to be that the EU is punching below its weight. The EU is a huge region with 500 million people, a huge part of the world economy. This is relatively close to the EU. Most experts and most literature, we think, see the EU as not a very influential actor compared to, for example, the US or China. <clears throat> and we expect to find many diplomats, but not so many uh, EU delegation diplomats, and this could be part of the explanation. So we were a bit surprised to find relatively many EU delegation diplomats, which raise, raises other questions. This, uh, these pie charts show the main European diplomatic missions in the eight countries in the region. Again, we see the orange ones, mostly upper left of each pie chart, is the EU delegation, the joint mission. The other ones are different countries. So dark red is uh, France. <clears throat> the blue up, upper right hand is Germany, um, and so on and so forth. And what we see is that in Five of the eight countries, the EU delegation is the biggest diplomatic mission from Europe, or, or the same size, or one of the two biggest, with the other one being the same size. So in this sense, again, we see a surprisingly strong European presence. On the other hand, Germany has an equally strong presence. Germany is also the biggest, or equal, equal size uh, as the biggest, in five of eight countries, but it has it's present in more countries, <clears throat> it's present in all of the countries, and where it's smaller, it's still relatively large. So Germany actually has more diplomats, it has 132 diplomats in the region, whereas the EU as a whole, uh, or the joint EU delegations, have 100 diplomats. So in this sense, the EU is still smaller than its bigger member country, biggest mem member country. Our final uh, graph, um, and these numbers are a little rougher, a little more difficult to work with, but they still give some interesting impressions. The US, this is four countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, where we happen to be able to get hold of data. So in these four countries, we see that the US has 164 diplomats. The EU has, the EU member states have 188, in addition to 57, in the EU delegations. So Europe is very well represented compared to the US. 
or China, which only has 59 in total, <clears throat> or Russia, and so on. The numbers for Turkey may be a little low because of the selection of countries. But for China and, and US and Russia, I think they should be pretty much representative for the whole region. So this returns us to the question of, is the EU, does it have a strong presence? Yes. I mean, does it have a big presence? Yes. Is it strong? Cha. Why? We don't know. But it's a very interesting question uh, for further research. Uh, I would say that the, the EU is punching below its weight compared to the US, both in terms of what the EU is uh, in Europe, but also in terms of its presence in the region. Um, it may have something to do with the organization. On the other hand, the light blue slice on the left top, the EU delegation, is relatively new. So the effect of the EU's presence that we're thinking about, which, matches, which reflects maybe the last 10 years of activity, may change as this light blue slice has recently grown and seems to continue to be growing uh, and may have an impact on overall EU activity. I'm not going to draw any very bombastic conclusions. I'm just going to finish off by saying a few words about where this may be taken further. First of all, we hope that this data set will be a big resource internationally, um, also for our institute. It'll go on the web pages on, on our institute as downloadable Excel files that anybody can use. And we see scope for expansion by <clears throat> looking more thoroughly at the other uh, external powers represented in the region. The, the last graph, but looking back, that was only for 2012, but looking trends over time in the kind of geopolitics and uh, so-called great game of the region. It would also be possible to expand the data to look at EU representation in co other countries around the EU, other countries of the former Soviet Union, North Africa, Middle East, Norway, and Switzerland, and so on. On the one hand, these are expansions of the data set. An alternative direction to take this in would be through in-depth studies that look more, now that you have this kind of context, to look more at the impact of the EU in specific locations to look at the division of labor in specific locations or cases or cross cases between the EU delegations and, multi and bilateral missions. For example, the boycott of Uzbekistan after 2005 on Dijan, where the EU is doing one thing, and our idea is that Germany may be, which is a very big actor in this context, bigger than the EU as a whole, um, is maybe doing slightly different things. Also, would be interesting to know more about local perceptions of the EU. The EU has a lot of diplomats in the region. How are they seen by locals? Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions to Indra now before we continue? Uh, yeah. Did you see whether the US uh, presence and the China presence? Over time. No. So that's one of the things we would have loved to have seen. Uh, but we were struggling enough since our task was European representation. We were kind of doing that as our hobby on the side. Um, a, but it's something we would like to do in the future, to see, see the trends over time. Also wondered a little bit whether maybe these, these Chinese numbers seem a little bit low. Because if we see one country that's really increasing its clout dramatically in the region, it's China. And are they really doing that on the back of so few diplomats? Are they so much more efficient than the diplomats of other countries? Could easily be. Um, or, or are data somehow skewed? Although we think these data are, are reasonably reliable for this, this graph here. GIZ, which is brings together three development organizations and our bank, uh, development bank, KFW, uh, staff of, of these organizations, uh, have you counted them as... Uh, <coughs> uh, and there's also a kind of the UK with DIFID, the development organization, and so on. Uh, are these diplomats? That's been one of the big challenges for us. Uh, so what, what the rule that we have followed is to say that if they're located in the embassy, or the EU delegation, if that's what we're looking at, and they have diplomatic status, 
uh, they're diplomats. If not, uh, they're not diplomats in our book. And of course, then we had to try to herd the people giving us information into following this rule. <clears throat> and then, of course, you could say that even if you manage to do that consistently, what is clear is that the practices of the countries uh, differ, not, not in terms of what you count, but in terms of where they locate. So some missions will integrate that kind of staff more into the mission, and some will externalize it more. But we, we ended up, after a lot of discussion over time among ourselves and with other actors, we ended up concluding that, well, that's the way it is. If, if a country chooses to, to have its aid workers and so on more integrated into its diplomatic apparatus, then it has a bigger diplomatic apparatus and a smaller aid apparatus. And we're measuring the diplomatic apparatus, so it becomes bigger. Um, and vice versa. But of course, that means that some of the countries that have small diplomatic missions maybe have other big missions. And this is particularly relevant when looking at the European delegation missions compared to bilateral ones. Because our impression is that European delegation missions tend to include quite a lot of aid actors. On the other hand, they are European delegation representatives, although they're working on aid. So it's, it's complicated. Okay. Uh, we were approached with an email, and from that email, our understanding about this challenging question about what, how you define a diplomat, our understanding was those who solely work on economic and political portfolios. So that figure uh, that is on the chart represents only those people with diplomatic status, but working on those specific subjects. <coughs> so therefore, in that case, if you're, you know, your uh, definition you just mentioned, uh, yeah, let me just, I, of course, Turkey comes out surprisingly small here. Just notice that the selection of countries here includes Azerbaijan, where I presume you have a lot, Armenia, where I presume you don't have a lot of diplomats, and uh, Tajikistan, where maybe also there are not so many Turkish diplomats. So that may partly explain it. <clears throat> Secondly, we, for most of the data, build on multiple sources. So uh, we've got data from you, but we also have data, for example, we have the diplomatic lists from the receiving country in, in many cases. Uh, and we also have other sources. So we're triangulating many sources. Uh, thirdly, uh, it doesn't exclude the, the, the possibility that there may be some misunderstanding or some uh, missource of, of data here. So we would be glad to check up with that, on that with you before we kind of finalize the data. Thanks a lot. Up there, and then we move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Neil Melvin, uh, and you will maybe give some answers to whether this increase in, uh, in the EU diplomats in the in the region has had any effect or not. So the the floor is yours. Should we remove this, maybe? Well, th thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I'd especially like to thank Indira for his extremely empirically rich presentation, because that now frees me from having to have any facts in my presentation at all, so I can just say exactly what I like, unencumbered by those kind of constraints. Um, I'd also like to say it's a great pleasure to be here at NUPI, and uh, it's always an institution who I, I followed very closely in your publications and research. And I was particularly gratified to learn that there is a program called Arctic, uh, Russia, and Eurasia, because at Cypri, I, I had a program where we do Arctic and Afghanistan projects. And I thought I was the only person who did that combination. So I'm glad to find some friends here who, who with a similar kind of portfolio. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is uh, sort of the, the EU's uh, efforts, which I think uh, uh, fill in the gaps to some degree around this empirical information. What was the EU been trying to do with this increase in the diplomats over the last few years? And, and also perhaps say why this is important more broadly for understanding some of the challenges that face the European Union as it seeks to craft itself as a sort of a major foreign security policy actor. So, of course, the EU is, is not new to Central Asia, as we saw in, in the table. Uh, there was a presence really from the very early 1990s. But really, it's only over the last decade that the EU has sought to step up its, its engagement. 
And this took place really uh, at a time when I suppose the EU was at the, on the top of its game in some ways in regarding foreign policy. The real push into Central Asia took place at look, when we look back now, what, what was really the peak of the EU as an external policy actor, I would say, i.e. in the period probably before the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, the effort to engage Central Asia uh, more uh, thoroughly was really, I think, part of a, a larger effort at that time in the EU to begin to try to respond to a new challenge. The EU had had 15 years of really unencumbered uh, freedom, particularly in its eastern neighbourhood. It was the model in town, along with the US, uh, and, of course, enlargement and so on. It was all good news. And then suddenly, uh, in the middle of the last decade, we began to see the real emergence of an alternative, i.e. the rise of these authoritarian capitalist orders, which began to uh, challenge the EU, not just in terms of actually the uh, efficiency of the economy, but even on a normative basis with their own conceptions of political orders about uh, what democratization meant, sort of more focus on traditional forms of democratization, they called it. So the EU strategy w was, it was in part, I think, an effort to try to uh, meet that challenge in an area which in many ways embodied some of these political orders. Uh, second, it was uh, one of the sort of the first real efforts, I suppose, in the East to actually have a policy well beyond the EU's borders. So this was, I guess, the equivalent of the sort of NATO out of area operations. This was an EU out of area operation. The Central Asian countries had no prospect of EU membership. <coughs> So the question was then, what could you do in such uh, a region of the world? Because, of course, up until then, EU foreign policy had really been about enlargement. So once you, once you don't have enlargement on the table, what exactly can the EU deliver in terms of its external policies? And so the EU strategy in Central Asia was part of that. And thirdly, it was, of course, uh, there was also much, much the rhetoric at the time about EU as a global actor, that the world needs the EU, the, these kind of slogans. Uh, it was a, sort of the backdrop rising up the Lisbon Treaty, the creation of the External Action Service, uh, and, of course, before the economic crisis. So this was, I think, really the, uh, the Central Asia strategy. Of course, it, it wasn't alone in this. There were other, other strategies in Africa and so on. And I think it was part of that effort to try to push beyond the immediate neighborhood and do some things concretely here. And lastly, uh, which I think is also maybe relevant to this data that you're talking about, it also formed part of, I think, a long-term process of actually displacing the OSCE. So I think in also looking at the numbers here, it would also be worth looking at what was happening with the OSCE, because of course what we've seen is the EU moving into the Balkans, then the Caucasus, and then arriving in the, in the last decade in Central Asia. And to some degree, displacing the OSCE either almost completely, as we perhaps see in the Balkans, uh, partially in, in uh, Caucasus and only slightly now in Central Asia, but increasingly as these numbers pick up, I wonder whether the OSC will also begin to suffer. So uh, what was the nature of this, uh, of this engagement? Well, I suppose the cornerstone has been the, the Central Asia strategy adopted in 2007, although the momentum up to that was also in place with the appointment of um, a European Union special representative already two years earlier. Uh, so there was effort to sort of move this forward. But why 2007? Well, that was, I think, fundamentally because the German EU presidency. And we saw in the numbers of diplomats there that Germany has been the overwhelming uh, powerhouse in terms of Central Asia uh, in the European context. And uh, the Central Asia strategy formed part of an effort of the German EU presidency to try to revitalize the Eastern policies, which I think we're beginning to feel were, were flagging and in terms of uh, the sort of ongoing uh, putin Medvedev policy, sort of stagnation in terms of Eastern policies to some degree. But also on the more positive side, the fact that there'd been an EU enlargement, the EU had now become um, a Black Sea country with Romania and Bulgaria, there was a European neighborhood policy in place. There was a Black Sea synergy. And so the Central Asia strategy was really sort of certainly filling a bit of a hole. It was an area that was left over in the post-Soviet space that didn't have a regional strategy. And of course, the EU loves regional strategies. Everything is about regions on the whole, and often regions sort of around the sea or something like that. So uh, Germany took up this mantle. Uh, but also, I think, beyond this kind of big thinking, EU thinking, there was also very uh, concrete national interests. Uh, Germany had a, a military base and still does, Termez in Uzbekistan, which was essential for its involvement in Afghanistan. 
It has significant economic interests in the region. Uh, and uh, it has a sort of a, a particular security relationship, not least, of course, with Uzbekistan, somewhat controversially around the Andijan events of 2005. So there was an effort by Germany, I think, to try and get a more strategic approach by the EU to these issues. And the last sort of uh, imperative around 2007 was, of course, the, the energy security debate, which also, I think, formed part of this rising alarm in the EU that it was being pressed, really, for the first time, and energy was part of that. We'd had the first uh, Russia-Ukrainian energy crisis, uh, and a sense that energy security itself was uh, a something that the EU was vulnerable on, and they had to try and respond to this. So uh, this, was the, this was then the backdrop for the adoption of the strategy. But the strategy itself became very much then an EU-style document. It was uh, uh, driven through the various committees, and so it had to become a consensus document. We had uh, the normal sort of bargaining around what the text was, and so the text ends up not as a very sort of precise strategic document, but actually rather a long list of commitments, commitments in human rights, democracy, rule of law, education, uh, civil society, and then a sort of effort to try to have this more strategic interest-based approach around issues to do with security, particularly Afghanistan and energy questions, and then the regional focus, uh, a regional focus that was to some degree, as I explained, just because there were five countries outside other EU structures, and so they went for a Central Asia regional strategy, although there's never really been clear precisely why Central Asia constitutes the region for the EU, other than there was a gap there. Uh, and a lot of efforts then to try and promote regional cooperation around this region that was to some degree defined by this, this sort of bureaucratic approach. So what then happened uh, to uh, this strategy? What does this tell us about the EU? Well, immediately, this effort to try to sort of build a new kind of strategic interest-driven approach to a, a part of the world caused tensions. And it caused tensions uh, in a number of ways. First of all, uh, the focus of the EU strategy became Uzbekistan in its early days. And this was viewed for a number of reasons, I think probably because of Germany's own interests uh, around the military questions, but also uh, because it was felt that if they're going to have a regional strategy, you had to have Uzbekistan at the heart of that. So uh, the focus for the initial struggle became rolling back the sanctions which had been put in place on Uzbekistan after the Andijan crisis in 2005. And almost immediately a split emerged among the EU member states and also, I would say, between diplomats and many of the EU civil society organisations over this issue. And this is really, I think, a, a wound that's really yet to be healed in some ways in regards to the EU's approach to Central Asia that, that stem from this time. Countries like uh, Sweden, uh, United Kingdom, tried to uh, modify the effort to roll back the sanctions, but ultimately lost. They just delayed the sanctions issue. And so uh, engagement was, was presented as the rationale. We had to engage in the EU, Central Asia, because without engagement, there could be no progress forward. And that meant, in a way, we had to try and sweep aside all the in incumbents for uh, engagement. And the way then to sort of deal with a variety of other questions uh, around engagement also caused a sort of source for tension. The EU introduced a human rights dialogue. So human rights were no longer mainstreamed, as they perhaps had been uh, to what had happened before to some degree, but were now to be part of purposely designed human rights dialogues separate from much of the rest of the diplomatic and, and political activities. Often these took place once a year. I think they're still once a year. Uh, but nonetheless kind of to one side of what was going on elsewhere. Um, additionally, there was a focus on energy. And here, of course, uh, Turkmenistan emerged as, in some ways, the core of this, this focus. Uh, Turkmenistan was uh, sort of El Dorado for the EU at this time. It was seen that this was a way to actually fight back against Russia by building... Uh, Southern Corridor, uh, with Nabucco pipeline at its core, creating a trans-Caspian uh, pipeline so that the Turkmen gas could reach European markets and thereby sort of subvert uh, Russian uh, control, particularly over Southeast Europe. 
But again, the, the focus on Turkmenistan by the EU, and, and, and uh, Turkmenistan was uh, the recipient of many delegations by the EU, or DG Energy, by the Commissioner for Energy, or Ottinger, by Relics, as it was, DG Head of Relics, Ferro Waldner, uh, by uh, uh, Head of the Commission Barroso, uh, ran into problems with the EU Parliament who have yet to actually ratify the PCA agreement with Turkmenistan because of human rights concerns. So again, the EU was split on its engagement with the efforts to try and promote an interest-based uh, uh, effort being undermined by a perception in the rest of the, uh, in key parts of the European sort of uh, civil society and member states that actually this ran counter to what were the real EU interest. So what we had for much of the first five years was a kind of twin track aspect to the strategy. There was um, uh, uh, a focus on security questions and a focus on energy questions led by the European Union Special Representative, Ambassador Pierre Morel, uh, supported by key member states, notably uh, Germany. And then a sort of the more formal uh, bureaucratic uh, aspects of the EU in which programs around education, uh, rule of law, uh, um, uh, discussions with uh, with these countries about technical assistance, and even I would say perhaps the human rights dialogue carried on sort of in their own pace. Ultimately, uh, we have now uh, after five years of this uh, process, a sort of the opportunity to look back on what has been achieved. And I think if you begin to break down what were the sort of the ambitions of the strategy uh, when it was launched in, in, in uh, 2007, we see in sort of, I guess, uh, three key areas the efforts to try and assess how engagement has gone. Well, first of all, on the human rights, democracy, and rule of law, uh, I, did, I could have had a slide here, but, but I actually um, I, I, uh, forgot it at home. But what I've done is I've looked at all the indexes that have been put together by Human Rights Watch, Freedom House, Amnesty, Transparency International, uh, Reporters Without Borders. And just as we see the line of EU representation going up, all those ones are going the other way. So in terms of actually how increased the capacity and EU effort in the region has, has actually uh, gone in terms of the politics of the region, what has happened is the strategy has coincided with an even deeper consolidation of authoritarian regimes across Central Asia. Uh, human rights uh, have got worse on the whole. Of course, Central Asia has been leading in uh, developing new techniques to clamp down on the internet and press freedom. So I think in, in that part, it's very hard to see there's been very much success. On the energy side, which was, I think, really also held up as uh, one of the major uh, ambitions of, of the EU policy, uh, five years after the launch, uh, we still see very little prospect of the Nabucco pipeline of even sort of commercial gas contracts with Turkmenistan. And the reality, of course, is that energy markets have changed fundamentally in that time. We now see uh, gas markets which are uh, going in very different directions, that the EU effort, which has really been a non-market-based approach, there's been efforts to try and aggregate demand, there's been efforts to try and build pipelines in the geopolitics. None of this is delivered on the whole, but also, in fact, markets have done their own thing. Uh, we see the sort of the whole unconventional gas revolution coming on, but also Azerbaijan itself has just uh, produced a kind of market-based solution. So Nabucco itself, except in its truncated form, now appears to be dead. Uh, so if we look, we look at Turkmenistan from an EU energy security uh, situation, increasingly these... Uh, efforts look not only unrealistic, but also irrelevant to some degree to what's happening elsewhere. Uh, it's possible that commercial uh, volumes will eventually uh, come from Turkmenistan to EU markets, but I don't think this is really going to be part of a, of a, a solution now to EU energy security. That's happening elsewhere, and it's also happening, of course, because the EU's perhaps most effective mechanism has been its internal market. And the third energy package has really perhaps been one of the most dramatic turnarounds rather than this external energy security policy. And I also wonder what degree what happened in Algeria may also raise concerns about being tied to, to unstable regions of the world for energy security. Thirdly, security itself. Uh, security was very much defined by the, uh, the focus on Afghanistan. Uh, this is now changing. We've had a lot of effort on border security, anti-narcotics, uh, and anti-terrorism. 
uh, quite a few other studies have come out questioning the effectiveness of the e EU border management projects, the, the Bomka projects, among others. Uh, some have even suggested, uh, perhaps rather he sort of heretically, that what has now been built is more effective infrastructure to transit drugs, because now there's better roads, better sort of crossing points than there was before. I'm not an expert on that, but I think that the secondary literature does uh, raise a lot of questions about how effective all that has been. But perhaps more damagingly, that focus really has meant that the EU missed at the internal security discussion by focusing on these ideas about external terrorist threats and the challenge from Afghanistan. The EU totally missed the break, near breakdown of the Kyrgyzstan state in 2010, uh, has since recovered a bit to do some crisis management, but is still, I think, not really engaged in understanding what causes political violence in Central Asia itself. So, I mean, the first five years, I think, have been fallen quite short uh, in terms of the ambitions. Uh, but as time is running out, I'll perhaps just turn now just to looking ahead a little bit. Uh, we see now, I think, uh, also a big change in Central Asia beginning. I mean, the five, the, when the Central Asia strategy was launched, not only was the EU a much stronger external actor than it is today, uh, but also there was a more benign uh, environment in Central Asia, more benign security environment with NATO really taking on the main security guarantor, not just for Afghanistan, but for the wider region. <coughs> this is now beginning to change, uh, and of course that is opening up a whole different situation in Central Asia itself, as other countries and blocs begin to move in to the region with the Russian effort to uh, sort of reintegrate Central Asia militarily and through its Eurasian Union, uh, Chinese sort of ongoing uh, uh, efforts to, to build better relationship, Iran, India having its uh, its strategy uh, about engaging Central Asia. So this is all changing now, and the EU also perhaps needs to look at these, the, these changes. Secondly, we have a, a, a growing instability in Central Asia linked to the uh, transitions of power that, that are begun already or are going to happen fairly soon. Again, the Central Asia strategy to, was launched at a time when really there were consolidated authoritarian regimes all across the region. Now we begin to look ahead to what will happen in Uzbekistan in the future. We've already seen two breakdowns of presidential regimes in Kyrgyzstan, uh, signs in Tajikistan that the, uh, the peace agreement from the 1990s beginning to come unstuck, violence almost every uh, summer autumn in Tajikistan. So the, I think that this is another security issue that needs to be uh, thought about. And lastly, I think, is that the fact that the region itself now increasingly is losing any kind of regional coherence that it might have had from an EU perspective. As, as I said at the beginning, to me, this was always a rather artificial idea to, to engage Central Asia as though the five countries, as though Kazakhstan and Tajikistan, could be put together in a single category. Now what we see increasingly is not only these external uh, actors looking at the region as the Western forces draw down from Afghanistan, growing infrastructure across the region, uh, going outside the region. Pipelines, roads, flights, uh, investments. So Central Asia itself is being integrated into a far bigger region. I mean, in, in, I think this is in some ways the, the big question now is will Central Asia cease to be a post-Soviet space and become something else completely? So to me, the EU is to start to look and actually try to improve on its performance in the first five years. It needs to recognize these, at least these three main areas to look at, how to become more dynamic, how to play to its strengths, and how to actually begin to sort of uh, anticipate <coughs> events in the region rather than sort of delivering a rather heavy program. I would say there are some signs, some positive signs. We've seen a new EUSR in place. Uh, I think the speeches that she has made have pointed to a, a, a different style of approach from, from her pre predecessor, perhaps a sense that the times are changing. But also maybe an awareness that the EU's greatest strength, given that it will be a, a second tier country, a second tier actor in, in Central Asia, is always likely to be its soft power. But it didn't play to that advantage in the first five years. What we see now is an effort to build um, a new security dialogue. There's going to be a new high-level security dialogue that was announced when Lady Ashton was in uh, Central Asia. And this isn't just going to be, the plan anyway, isn't just going to be a set piece, uh, sort of ministerial one, but actually to have working groups leading into that discussion. 
And from what we know from the wider literature, of course, this is, I suppose, what the EU does best, <coughs> this effort to try and socialize around different norms through regular interaction. This hasn't been the case with the EU strategy up to now. Indeed, I think many people have pointed to a reverse socialization in which often the EU has seemed to speak the language of Central Asia, the focus on, on terrorism, on special values, uh, and these kind of things. So I think maybe that we're starting to see a new phase, or perhaps a more uh, uh, realistic phase in, in the EU strategy. Uh, but still, I would say there's quite a long way to go. But perhaps I'll wrap it up as uh, I think probably we can have, take some questions. Yeah. Okay. Have uh, one or two questions now, and then we'll move on. Maybe is there any question now? Uh, I have one question. Do you think there is a difference between, uh, I mean, the EU's uh, presence or the EU's approach in Central Asia uh, compared to EU's role in the Caucasus, which is part of the neighborhood policy, or is it more or less the same picture? that can be drawn from, the, from that region? Well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not such an, uh, well versed on the Caucasus, but I mean, my sense is that the Caucasus is seen as part of the neighborhood for the EU, I mean, as reflected in the European neighborhood policy, and the problems of the Caucasus are seen uh, to be integral in a way in the EU project, the larger project. Uh, so we've had a much higher level of engagement. It also reflects directly the question of the relationship to Russia, which runs through the whole of the Eastern neighborhood. Central Asia strategy has in many ways been shaped by factors outside Central Asia. It's not seen as central to that. So we've seen on the one hand the Afghanistan question. So the sort of security engagement has been not about Central Asia. It's been about Europe and Afghanistan, of which Central Asia is, is, is sort of necessary for those purposes, particularly around the bases. And secondly, it's been about how to deal with the Russian energy security challenge. So it's sort of more been a reflection of these other things. And I think that's why you can see some of the weaknesses in the approach to the region. It's, it's never really been defined why Central Asia is important in itself to the European Union. It's not seen as part of the European project. Uh, and as I say, the language often even that diplomats, some diplomats in the, in the European member states and the EU talk about the region they draw a line that this is somehow culturally different as well, which I think then that's why human rights and democracy issues are also perhaps not being pushed in the way they have been in, say, the Caucasus. Now, whether that's just a mindset or, or whether that uh, reflects also interests, I think is, is, is unclear. In a way, the swing state is Kazakhstan, because Kazakhstan has expressed some ambitions to be part of the European project, Sort of on a, on a light level, it plays in the European, it plays in UEFA <laughs> rather than in the Asian leagues, which the rest of Central Asia does. But also, it has a I mean, it has a diplomatic uh, uh, document, the Path to Europe, which it, it launched around the time that the Central Asia strategy was uh, involved, and it's uh, expressed ambitions to, uh, if not take on board the whole sort of gamut of EU values in terms of politics, sort of political and, and human rights questions. It has expressed a desire to uh, converge on EU standards in areas like education and science and so on. So there's sort of some, there's some effort there, I think, and a sense that even that the Council of Europe might be something that Kazakhstan would have a, 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 an enhanced relationship with. Yeah, one more, and then, then we uh, uh, I'm Reza, a visiting research fellow here in NUPI. Uh, we see that the security engagement of Europe with uh, Central Asia is significantly focused on the operation that's now going on in Afghanistan. That operation is planned to come almost to an end in 2014 and afterwards. Uh, how will EU engagement with Central Asia be shaped afterwards, first. Second, uh, you were saying that one of the strengths of the EU is to use its soft power in the region. Do you think how relevant soft power will be in an extremely authoritarian environment? Yeah. So those are two uh, small questions. So. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I think you're right. Is that, is that we're not going to have a big, uh, you know, a significant change uh, with this um, with this drawdown of troops? Some EU countries will have no probably military presence at all in in Afghanistan. Uh, a small group will have a sort of small group number, probably in, include, including some non-EU countries like Norway, but uh, and non-NATO countries like Sweden and Finland. Uh, so there'll be some European troops uh, there. But um, uh, we're going to have a period of uh, the uh, reverse transit, as they call it, when all the stuff comes out. So I think Central Asia will continue to be important while that happens. All this equipment is moved out. Beyond that, I would say that there is a big risk that interest will drop off enormously in Europe, in, in Central Asia, because I say Central Asia has not been really defined, except perhaps uh, on the hydrocarbon side, as something of a... Of a a region of interest other than for the Afghanistan uh, question. So it may be that we move back a little bit more to the way that the EU approached the region before uh, the strategy was launched, which would be a, a rather less engaged, more sort of focus on normative issues. I would say that, I mean, if, if the EU is going to actually uh, uh, be a global actor, it needs to start thinking not just about Central Asia, but about where Central Asia is and what it's part of. And this has, I think, been, one, again, one of the weaknesses of the EU. It's had these sort of compartmentalized approaches, uh, rather un undynamic. But uh, Central Asia today faces this issue in which uh, China, India, Iran, uh, Russia, United States, and EU are all present in a region which has totally undefined uh, regional security structures in a way going forward. I mean, there are some, but none of them really work effectively. So I think the question really is, how is this region going to evolve and how is that going to fit into the wider discussion of our Asian security arrangements? Because what happens between China and America in Central Asia and Afghanistan, of course, will have a wider significance. So to me, the EU is actually to, to sort of develop a, a serious role for Central Asia. It also needs to understand a bit this wider things. It needs to actually integrate Central Asia functionally into what would be a real strategy, not, not a list of sort of programs, but actually what, how does the EU understand the world? How is it going to engage in that world? And this has, I think, sadly been lacking up to this point, uh, that there's quite a lot of uh, programming. Uh, we see uh, creation of new capacities with new people, but I think the question is what are they doing? And what is the ambition? It's never been clear to me what the EU actually wants to achieve precisely in this region. I mean, there's a long list of things, but what really can, does it want to achieve and what it can achieve? And that would involve actually defining what a strategy is, what are your real goals, and how do you get there, not what is a sort of a programmatic approach to the region. So I think, I mean, Af the change in Afghanistan could either crystallize that discussion in Europe if Europe is going to actually look after its interests and be a global actor, then what does that mean and how does Central Asia fit into that? Or you could see a sort of a, a very significant collapse of interest in Central Asia and sort of a pullback, which is, which is happening in other places, I guess, too. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We move on to, to the last speaker, Pius Bomstra, who is going to talk about uh, the EU's approach to the development security nexus in Central Asia. I wonder if maybe you, sh you two should sit up here while the so we can go directly uh, off on to the, the Q&A session. He's going to talk, yeah, he's going to come pre present uh, yourself, maybe. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Uh, very good to be at NUPI again. I was here four years ago for a seminar about the Caucasus, which was excellent. My name is Jos Boonstra. I work as a researcher for Friede, which is a think tank uh, based in Madrid, but also with an office in Brussels, where I am based. Uh, maybe w one of the first things to, to, to say, uh, next to only looking at the diplomatic presence in Central Asia and in the Caucasus, it would also be interesting to see uh, what, uh, how many people work on these regions in their national capitals. Uh, just to give you an example, when I asked this uh, when I was still in Spain, uh, Spain constantly said, for us, uh, Central Asia is a priority. And I asked them at some point during their uh, EU presidency, how many people are working on, on Central Asia? Well, we have no one in specific, but we have somebody at least working for the broader region, uh, so also including Eastern Europe, Russia, and the Caucasus. 
I think in the Spanish ministry there are probably about 200 people working specifically on Cuba. So this is maybe interesting to also uh, see how many people are uh, engaged <coughs> on a specific region. Um, Central Asia is often uh, discussed in terms of uh, uh, great games. Uh, there was, of course, this great game uh, 100 years ago. I don't believe in great games nowadays. I think for the EU, but maybe also for the US, and even for Russia, the most you can get out of Central Asia at the moment is trouble, is problems. And that's why the interest is very low in this region, except for energy. And we've just heard that over the last five years, for the EU, this has not resulted in, in uh, gas imports from, uh, from Turkmenistan, uh, or it is Kazakhstan. Uh, and the secu and broader security problems. Uh, at the moment, uh, the program I'm working on, EUCAM, is doing some uh, very uh, short qualitative studies on national policies towards uh, Central Asia, national European policies. So it's sort of quantitative version of the qualitative version of the quantitative version uh, done by NUPI. Uh, our conclusions so far, and we've only done 10 countries so far, very different from the uh, United Kingdom to Portugal and so on, is that with the exception of Germany, most countries say, EU member states at least, we are very happy that the EU is taking the lead in Central Asia, then we don't have to follow that that closely, then we are, uh, don't have to mention too much about uh, democracy and human rights. Let the EU represent us there, except Kazakhstan. We are very keen to do business with this blossoming economy uh, and we want an embassy there and the oil and the gas and the also other parts of the economy are more and more important. So that's a bit uh, the picture uh, we got from there. Uh, so, also Europe has not that many interests in Central Asia. After uh, Russia and China, it's maybe third place, or the United States would be third place. I think the US has much more leverage, much more power, also hard security interest there, while the EU is much more active, as we also saw from the figures uh, that Indra showed us. Uh, and uh, to echo a little bit uh, what Neil said on uh, what has been done these last five years under the EU strategy, I think there have been some achievements. Uh, the presence in the region, there are more uh, EU uh, representatives there. Uh, delegations have been opened recently in Uzbekistan. I know the EU is very keen on opening uh, a representation or a delegation in, uh, in Turkmenistan. Um, also, uh, the relationship with uh, Kazakhstan and trade with Kazakhstan has been a positive uh, development. Europe is, the, in, in I think almost every Central Asian country, the, the biggest investor. But there are more shortcomings and lack of results. So, um, there has been no gas imports from Turkmenistan. Uh, the region has become more instable and there are more security concerns. There has been no democratic development or better good governance, and there has been no improvement in uh, human rights uh, records. So <clears throat> in that sense, uh, I was slightly disappointed uh, last summer when the EU uh, published a review after a long review process of five years of EU uh, strategy. Basically, the argument was uh, we still have to build this further. Uh, a lot of uh, things are in motion, uh, which is true. Uh, and let's just continue. That was it. There was one more specific point they made, and that was Afghanistan. They said there is a concern, as uh, the gentleman uh, already asked about Afghanistan, uh, what, what, what should happen in the period uh, until 2014 when troops are leaving and afterwards. And this review said, yes, there is a problem with this. We need to link Afghanistan programs more with uh, the Central Asia programs, and we have to focus on that. I find that very tricky, uh, to be honest. First of all, because there's very little room for linking programming of EU regional thinking on Central Asia to specific thinking on uh, Afghanistan. There might be some options in education 
maybe border control, uh, maybe also involving Russia, <coughs> but chances are limited. But the biggest problem I have with this is the narrative on security. At least in my view, instability and insecurity in Central Asia are largely homegrown problems. So it's the problem with uh, no succession mechanisms for aging presidents. What will happen if Karimov uh, passes away in Uzbekistan? Who will be the new leader? Uh, it's very uncertain. Uh, is uh, Islamic uh, radicalism often does not originate from uh, Afghanistan, but is homegrown, typically as we see in uh, uh, Tajikistan, for instance. Uh, huge levels of corruption, poverty, uh, migration problems of all young uh, uh, Kyrgyz and Tajik men that work in Russia. Uh, what is their future if they return? Uh, these are the security problems these countries uh, face. And we often hear a narrative from Central Asian <coughs> leaders that everything will collapse and everything will go wrong when troops leave uh, Afghanistan because there will be all these negative spillover effects, mostly radicalism, secondly, drug flows. These drug flows have been there constantly during the war, before the war, and probably also in a few years' time. And the EU should, I think, be very careful not to fully accept that narrative of spillover effects from Afghanistan, although it is, of course, a risk. Maybe also interesting to, to, to mention in this respect is the difference between the European Union and the United States and how they view Central Asia. <clears throat> For the European Union, Central Asia is the neighbor of the neighbors. So it's the neighbors uh, uh, in, in, in our neighborhood policy, and we see Central Asia as an extension of that. <clears throat> and we like to think in regions, as Neil Melvin uh, said, so it has a, a regional policy. The Americans see it uh, completely the other way around. They say, we have an Afghanistan policy, and as a annex of that, we also have a uh, interest in Central Asia. And if it's not focused on Afghanistan, then they uh, would rather prefer the last few years to see Central Asia from an Asian perspective, not from a European-Russian perspective. Um, also, uh, I was slightly disappointed with uh, the visit of uh, Lady Ashton in November. Uh, there were great <laughs> hopes in the External Action Service that she would go there, and there was a lot of lobbying inside of the EU to <coughs> make sure that uh, the High Representative uh, would visit. Uh, and I think it was a bit of a missed opportunity. It was great that she went to, to uh, four of the five countries. She didn't go to Turkmenistan, maybe also as a message to say to the Turkmens, when will we get our delegation here in uh, Ashgabat? But I think it uh, would have been an opportunity to present something new, to, do, uh, to come up with a new proposal. And that was uh, uh, not really the case. It was, again, this continuation of a process that started uh, five years ago. Um, then a little bit about uh, broader European policies. Um, well, it's, as, as we see, uh, saw, it's only Germany, France, and the UK that have embassies in all five Central Asian countries. Germany is, is by far the biggest uh, act actor on behalf of Europe uh, in Central Asia. I think for every uh, two euros that uh, the European Union spends on development aid in Central Asia, uh, Germany tops that with another euro. And uh, if you would uh, make a calculation of Germans' presence, so not only the diplomats, I think for every uh, uh, European official, there are two Germans present. Also because there are these Stiftungen, uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, and so on, who also have a lot of people uh, present. So Germany is, 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 is very uh, present. Uh, OSCE, as we heard, much less nowadays, uh, but in Tajikistan, the OSCE is doing quite well. Tajikistan is a country that was planning <coughs> uh, about five, six years ago to also push out the OSCE, but was convinced by OSCE uh, uh, presidency at that point and other uh, European leaders to invest in the OSCE, and that mission is doing uh, quite uh, well. 
NATO in uh, Central Asia is 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 really small. It it uh, it's maybe Kazakhstan that has some is quite active in the Partnership for Peace, and has an IPAD program with them. But in the other countries, NATO doesn't play that much a role. Um, one thing that is more and more featured in uh, European documents is the link between security and development. Uh, you see it also in this review that came out last summer, that it's more and more uh, mentioned, this link. Uh, of course, it's true. Uh, you, you cannot really uh, have uh, good development in a country if it is not secure and vice versa. So it seems to make sense, but there's also a lot of criticism about this. First of all, uh, it can lead to the securization of development. Um, one example is, for instance, uh, maybe in this sense, the BOMCA border control program, which is the only more hard security program that the EU does in Central Asia. But it's paid from a development budget. And also in a lot of European countries, we have had debates over the last 10 years about uh, mixing budgets for defense and for development aid and foreign affairs. In some countries, at least the country where I come from, they call this uh, budget pollution. And uh, this is something uh, that uh, it always needs to be under consideration. Uh, a second criticism is uh, that this link, this nexus uh, between security and development uh, leads to confusion and inc incoherence. The narrative is not really clear. We don't know what we want to achieve by this. Is it security or development uh, objectives? Um, often also quite pure development issues like poverty are now presented in a uh, more securitized way. There's one maybe advantage of this, and that is that security issues, at least on a European agenda, normally receive more attention. <laughs> And thirdly, uh, there is little proof of results of better policies if you link these two. And even it has been suggested that linking security and development leads to supporting uh, quite uh, authoritarian uh, regimes and accepting their, their narrative uh, on security, fighting terrorism, and so on, as I mentioned before. A uh, few words about uh, development. Um, over the last seven years, uh, the EU has allocated 750 million euros to Central Asia. You can double that amount if you add all the uh, EU member state uh, national uh, programs to that. But this 750 million, uh, you can see this in different ways. Is it a lot or is it uh, almost nothing? Uh, you can say it's almost nothing if you divide it over seven years, five countries, and end up with about 30 million uh, per country. If you compare that to the assistance that's going to Georgia, it's peanuts. On the other hand, you can also say it's quite a lot on development, because uh, several of these countries don't have a lot of uh, absorption capacity to use uh, and spend these funds uh, well. I don't expect any rise on the current economic and financial circumstances for the next seven years on this amount. It's not, I think, the amount that is that important in this case. It's more how it is used, how it is spent. Um, if we go by the five Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan did receive development funding in the past, but that will uh, come to an end, I understand, uh, basically because it is a middle-income country. Uh, now, Turkmenistan is too closed, Uzbekistan often too repressive, so we are left with the two real development countries, which is Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Now, the money that goes there goes for a large part, at least the EU funding, to uh, sector budget support. And this is quite tricky, especially in Tajikistan, which is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. What is the guarantee for the European taxpayer that that money is actually used for the things uh, that was agreed to. Most countries would say never budget support to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. The EU does choose this as a sort of socialization with these countries and hoping to also make their uh, bureaucracies more effective. Uh, but you can have uh, severe doubts uh, about budget support. Um, the second way we uh, spend our money there is, and I'm quite critical now, 
is uh, on quite large projects where uh, European or even non-European uh, consultancy firms tender. So uh, a lot of the money goes to European consultancy firms that might not have really experience in Central Asia. They go there, they write their report, often a brilliant report, but the report ends up at a shelf uh, in the European Commission and often is not even accessed by uh, uh, member states. Plus, you have Kyrgyz and Tajik civil society people and also government people that say, we hear that uh, 10 million was allocated to this and this subject in, in our country, but we haven't seen anything of it. We only saw a few visitors who stayed in nice hotels here. Uh, so this is another uh, criticism. And why I said that 750 million can be quite a lot is if you would really try to invest in civil society, in the broader civil society organizations there. But to do this in an effective way, you need all those diplomats that Indra mentioned and even probably more to make sure that you give the money to the right people and organizations. Um, Maybe lastly, to put things a little bit in perspective and link with, with Afghanistan, I think very roughly said in Afghanistan, most of the development funding on behalf of Europe is done by national countries. So it's national, Swiss, Norwegian, Dutch, French <coughs> money going there. But the EU still spends a lot of uh, money there. But it's secondary to the national contributions. In Central Asia, it's completely the other way around. There, the EU is by far the biggest actor in development aid, although the money it allocates is peanuts compared to what it spends in Afghanistan, where it is a small player. So that just to compare the amount and the interest there is in Afghanistan and the little interest there is in uh, Central Asia. Uh, on security, uh, very quickly, too, Quick points, maybe we can uh, discuss this further uh, later on. BOMCA, which was already mentioned by Neil Melvin, in the over the last five years often mentioned as a successful uh, project uh, in which all five countries participate. Um, although most of the attention nowadays of BOMCA is focused on one external border, and that is between Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan. Uh, I find it quite a problematic program because in Tajikistan, for instance, where most of the attention is focused now, um, it has become clear that the Tajik government is very interested in hardware. They are interested in new jeeps. They are interested in having new offices uh, for border guards and so on. They are less interested in training and long-term planning. So it's quite a short-term and equipment-focused, uh, and elsewise there are less interest. And there have been quite a number of, of uh, suspicions and reports of uh, uh, Tajik officials themselves being implicated in, uh, in the drug uh, uh, business. So whatever you do, if the people you, you finance uh, uh, don't want a, a radical change and reform, uh, it is just a uh, drop on a hot plate. And this is again a choice for Europe. If Europe and its member states find it so important, this border control issue and drug seizures, then they should really invest and make a choice and they should uh, try to establish a, a common security and defense uh, policy mission uh, on that border. Probably it should be done in, in, in cooperation with, uh, with Russia. That will play a bigger role. But that is what the EU will do if they're really concerned as they were in Georgia where they have a mission, or many years before when they uh, started a mission in uh, Transnistria on the border between Moldova and, and Ukraine. But this is not on the table because it's too far away. We don't have enough interest there, so it uh, will not happen. The last thing uh, on security is security sector reform. As I mentioned, a lot of problems in these countries with stability, with repressive police forces. Uh, <clears throat> uh, with weak uh, militaries, weak democratic control, security sector reform is something that Europe might, in some of these countries, uh, have a contribution. Uh, Chairman, do I have 
time, uh, the chair will... Uh, uh, one, one minute to wrap up, maybe? One minute. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then, then I'll wrap up. Uh, I would be happy later on to, to tell a little bit, uh, let me say one sentence about Tajikistan, because I already uh, told a lot. And then I'll uh, leave the conclu conclusion for later. Uh, Tajikistan, again, about uh, representation there. Um, the first time I went there, I needed to do a lot of interviews, uh, mostly with, with people based there. So I write emails to the embassies that are there. The European embassies there is China, uh, sorry, uh, uh, France, uh, Germany, and the U UK. At that time, uh, Sweden had an office there uh, of their development organization, SIDA. Uh, the Swiss uh, had a development office there and still have, and the EU was present. So I write all these emails and have a lot of meetings and, and so on. But every time I go to the same cafe in the middle of uh, uh, Dushanbe, the capital, where there is an Italian coffee uh, cafe, and I, later I find out it's not necessary to make all these appointments because if you just go to this cafe, sit down there for one week with your laptop, there is Wi-Fi, all these diplomats come in walking themselves because they meet there, it's just one place. Uh, so. Just to give you a little bit of a, a, an idea of the, of the scale of, uh, of presence uh, in, in Tajikistan. Um, but uh, I think Tajikistan, uh, maybe together with Uzbekistan, will be most high on the agenda concerning Central Asia, uh, especially from a security point of view. <coughs> um, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. I think. Then we uh, open up for questions and answers, and you may sit here if you want to. And then if you have questions to all the speakers, actually, you can uh, post the questions uh, now. <laughs> oh, yeah. This one. OK, it was one question here. Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Doug Halvorsen. I uh, work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but uh, uh, until last summer I was ambassador in Astana, uh, covering all this uh, region for three and a half years. We started up in 2009, small correction to Indra. <laughs> but so it was extremely interesting for me to listen to all these uh, presentations. And uh, of course, uh, I, uh, I think uh, your assessments are very, uh, very good, mostly. But um, but uh, I I think that I would just like to make a couple of small points. And um, first of all, I think that um, uh, despite all the the serious uh, judgments on EU policy that have been made uh, now or critical, shall we say, I think on on the whole, um, I think it's necessary to offer to the EU some recognition and maybe some encouragement because. Um, uh, they are also needed in Central Asia, uh, especially in Kazakhstan. They have this multi-vector policy. They don't want to be uh, associated <coughs> or uh, with one of the five main partners, with Norway, China, Norway, Russia, Norway, any other country. They want to be independent. So in this context, the EU is needed. Uh, and I think the EU has a lot of uh, good cards to play with. Uh, first of all, they are a big uh, trade part, trading partner. I think the, the biggest, in fact, with uh, Kazakhstan, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and with the others, uh, probably also. And uh, then um, they have a lot of diplomats. Of course, uh, if you look at uh, number of diplomats compared to results, maybe China is better situated because uh, China has fewer diplomats compared to the influence it, it does now uh, exert. But uh, the reason for that is that they have deeper pockets, I think, mainly. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and of course, this points to another uh, aspect of EU and policy, that there are so many actors involved. In, in Kazakhstan, in Astana, I think my EU colleagues numbered uh, just about 20. In Ashgabat, uh, quite less, but uh, they uh, they met every three weeks at uh, long meetings to uh, formulate uh, clear messages, and they, I think they succeeded to a large extent. And, um, but uh, it was difficult. And, um, and the strength is that, uh, the second thing is that uh, the EU has uh, considerable soft power. And that is because the EU is uh, the Western democracies, European democracies are the model for especially Kazakhstan, but also um, 
the others. So all the legislative reforms take EU standards or European Council of Europe standards uh, for models. And, uh, and this, uh, of course, is, uh, if this were to be implemented to the full, that would mean the end of the autocratic regime. So it's a bit of a uh, schizophrenic situation. I mean, you can't have both, but they try to. So, but this means that EU power, soft power is important. And uh, that means that they also will be listened to. Um, and uh, I think also that um, uh, the fact that uh, the EU does not have military uh, hardware uh, or hard military power is uh, maybe a problem to some extent, uh, say, in, uh, in the countries around the Caspian. But, um, uh, but it, um, it is also uh, a fact that the EU consists is a very difficult structure to understand for uh, external partners. And uh, uh, countries in Central Asia have a, a preference for uh, bilateral partners. For example, visiting Paris or London or Berlin is so, so much more uh, um, easier to, to handle than the, the very complicated structures in Brussels. So that is uh, something that reflects on the efficiency of the EU. But, um, but another aspect of the soft power is that uh, if you look at the elites in Central Asia, these post-Soviet elites, uh, where do they buy uh, summer houses? Where do their children go for studies? Where do they uh, invest their money? Uh, uh, it's in Europe, um, I mean, to a large extent. I mean, some go studying in China, some go invest their money in the US. And, but Europe is really the focus of those elites, uh, family-wise and, and so on. And uh, this may change now, perhaps, if you, the younger businessmen, they look at Singapore and they say, isn't that our model? Why do we need all these European ideals and, uh, and rules? We can uh, do like the Asian tigers. But for now, I think the the elites in Kazakhstan and also the other countries are very much oriented towards Europe. So um, this is a strength for the EU. So if the EU can uh, uh, can use that to find the right approach, uh, they still are not uh, uh, losing. I mean, they have lots of, um, of prospects. So yes, this is. Uh, Okay, since this was more of a comment, I will add a question uh, to that. Uh, maybe you can uh, have, if there are not more questions, I think maybe I'll give you a few minutes each just to, to have a last wrap up before we end this seminar. But I would just add a question, um, because Indra, you started out on, on a rather positive note, uh -huh. saying that there is an increase in the, the, the EU presence in the region, and then we ended on what, what do these diplomats really do in the region, maybe not uh, so much as uh, as far as um, I understood, but maybe you can say something about uh, some piece of advice to the EU. What should the EU or what what could the EU be doing in uh, the region? What could they do better in order to increase their soft power capacities? So that will be my kind of broad question. If you have any <laughs> any advice, and if there are no more questions, then I think we just uh, give the give the floor back to, to, the, to the panelists. Indra, you can start. Yeah, I guess um, my impression is quite simple, is that the, the EU has the resources. It, it could even cut its, its, the resources it spends um, in the region and still have a lot, of, a lot of people there, a lot of capacity for analysis and, and for interaction. Um, how to make this work more efficiently? I'm not sure, but my guess is that there is more need for coherence uh, and for coordination. Um, and that may be not just a question of internal structure, of, of discussion among the EU diplomats. Read and hear several places about endless coordination meetings every week, sometimes every day in some situations, between various uh, EU uh, actors. Um, Perhaps it's, it's also about the external side, that as long as the EU is represented by very many different offices, institutions, countries, embassies, and so on, it'll be seen as many different things, as, as kind of split into many different things. And as long as it's seen, not as one big block, but as uh, many different things would have some vague kind of association with, with each other in one block, it'll remain uh, a bit weak. So that's uh, one kind of uh, guess from my side. 
Uh, Jos and I were also talking before the meeting. Jos was bantering around with so, some, some interesting uh, numbers, which maybe you could mention in terms of the, the economic resources uh, spent. Would you uh, maybe return to that for, or, on your comment? Um, yeah, I think I'd, I'd just like to note actually, I mean, I think I agree very much with the ambassador's comments. I mean, I think the EU has enormous assets in a way in, in Central Asia. And but what I think the source of disappointment has been is that there's a feeling that the sum of the parts is much less than it should be, is that the EU has these resources, but it hasn't actually played to those strengths. And it's done that because it's uh, uh, it, it, Part of its soft power strength is, of course, its normative power. It's also, it's not just the EU and its member states, but also EU civil society. And there's, there's been a sort of actually uh, antagonism within the EU about the policy itself, which has helped to sort of weaken that. But, but I, I think that, I mean, the EU could play a much more uh, important role. I think it has to accept that it's always going to be a second division player, as, as I mentioned. I mean, China, we see China just uh, in terms of its investment is, is going to become much more important. It's already very important. We see Russia making a big effort on the military side. And we, of course, the US is, is, is there. But the EU, I think, can do some things. And in fact, just a bit of self-advertising, I actually have this paper out in this EU CAM series, which is uh, the EU needs a new values-based realism for its Central Asia strategy, which is an effort that I, I, I've tried to do in here to actually say, how can you make sort of soft power operational? What exactly do you need to, what, where should the focus be? How can the EU play to those strengths? And I, I think some of those issues are not in this sort of trying to play a great game. I mean, the, the actors who are good at the great games are the Russians and the United States uh, who can sort of got the resources and the way of thinking. The EU d does rather different things well. So I think it has to look at its diplomacy. I mean not just going there to, to uh, have uh, diplomats who are going to administer these aid programs rather unfocused, sort of churning out, but you know, where should the money go? Can we build up constituencies in Central Asia precisely who are European looking, who have been educated in Europe, sort of thinking in terms of European values? I think NUPI, as I understand, is doing some very interesting work in capacity building with bringing people from Central Asia at CIPRI. We've just started a similar program where we're going to take young people from Central Asia uh, and uh, actually take them to Washington and then to, to Stockholm to get, they get experience of working in a policy institute. So how can you build up those, those kind of uh, communities around a sort of liberal democratic modernization of Central Asia, sort of an alternative paradigm to what's coming from the East, which is a sort of non-liberal democratic modernization? You know, what can the EU bring to that kind of project? And I think I mean, Kazakhstan is very much obviously at the front, the front of that relationship, but others too could be as we begin to see these political changes going on in places like Uzbekistan. But I think that's going to require the EU to focus on things such as um, uh, conflict prevention, conflict management, not sort of big missions, but can its diplomats actually engage in conflict processes relatively not heavy operations, but can it be smart use of diplomacy to leverage the EU's position around these issues? Because the EU is a sort of, um, I think it's, it's perceived in the region as a relatively independent uh, outside actor. It doesn't have the interest that people see that China and Russia and others have in the region, so it can play that neutral role. I think there, I mean, there is some positive work being done on the water question, where the EU is trying to, to I think, negotiate and find a way forward with Uzbekistan and Tajikistan uh, and Kazakhstan on this very vexed question of how to share water across the region. I think that the, uh, Yoss has already spoken about the development question, which is very important in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. But again, how do we focus that? What, you know, we have some resources, it's not a lot, but that can actually have a big impact if it's actually focused on something serious and not as at the moment where it seems to spread very Generally, and lastly, I would say is education uh, as a whole. What we're seeing in Central Asia, in many parts of Central Asia now, is the final gasp of the Soviet education system. So the infrastructure that these countries inherited <coughs> from the Soviet Union is collapsing. Uh, it's not just the buildings, but the teachers who, who came through the Soviet system, and for all its faults, nonetheless, there was, there was a strong sort of primary and secondary education, uh, a learning of Russian, so you had an outside access 
that generation of teachers is, is now retiring. Uh, the school system in many parts of Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan is collapsed. In Turkmenistan, you've had people being taught on the Rukh Namar now for 15 years. Uh, in Uzbekistan, a very closed environment. So I think I mean, this also is the EU uh, discussion. But this isn't the, the Bologna process, which is often what the EU talks about. It's much more fundamental than that. It's how to sort of have basic functioning primary education in these countries. So I think that's, to me, if I was to say the EU, you know, focus on things that they can do well and that actually in the long term are going to be important to play to the sort of EU's role around this modernized, liberal democratic modernization model. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, four points maybe to conclude with. Uh, f first also, uh, a little bit in reaction to, to what the ambassador, uh, former ambassador to Astana said. I, I fully agree uh, that EU should be recognized for uh, stepping up over the last five years in Central Asia. And in many cases, I, I, I try to think, what would I do if I would be sitting in uh, an EU delegation in one of these countries? Probably not much diff uh, different. It's really difficult. Uh, uh, I also believe that uh, the EU does have much more leverage in uh, Central Asia than it thinks it has. Uh, for instance, in Tajikistan, often it is said that Tajik officials would say, oh, but then we ask China. They will uh, invest much quicker, and that will be no problem, so we don't need a European money. That's not true, I think. I think there's more a fear of China, of China investing too much and having too much influence in a country like Tajikistan. So it's essential for such a country to have other uh, partners, and especially the EU that is still, uh, it, it's good to be recognized by the EU. It's good to be on the picture with Barroso in Brussels and so on. For young countries that seek recognition, this is important. Also, if the EU would lose or get rid of its values component and would not bother these countries on democracy and human rights anymore, what would that bring that to us? Would we start building uh, railroads and pipelines in the same speed as China does in Central Asia? I don't think so. Would we be just as effective and quick to respond, if necessary, to military crises in, in uh, those regions as Russia does? No, probably not. So I think it's an essential component, these values. Uh, secondly, uh, <coughs> regional cooperation, uh, as al was already mentioned, it's completely lacking there. All regional cooperation comes from outside and is uh, initiated by China, Russia, or Europe, or Americans. So I do think it's, it's, it's important for the EU to play a role in this, especially on such uh, sensitive issues as water management, which can really become conflict uh, in, in the future. On the other hand, the EU needs to be very careful there. Uh, if we can bring these countries around the table uh, to, to work together, that would be great. But there's also another side of the coin. We have done this for many, many years in the Balkans, uh, regional cooperation, regional cooperation, until uh, people in the Balkans said, we are quite tired of this group therapy. Uh, we just want our own uh, role towards the EU. Um, third, um, uh, a security narrative is necessary, not the narrative necessarily of uh, Central Asian states that things might collapse when troops leave from Afghanistan, but one uh, based on, on the problems these countries face uh, and an open discussions uh, with these countries and not only focused on terrorism and extremism, but on, 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 on broader uh, security challenges these countries face. And then the EU should really think what can it contribute concretely, not in uh, nice texts? And lastly, uh, the EU uh, should not try maybe to explain itself too much in Central Asia. We barely understand ourselves how the EU functions. Uh, so it will be prob problematic for uh, uh, the average Central Asian to understand uh, the EU. It's also not necessary to everywhere put stickers with uh, a blue flag with golden stars to be uh, recognized. But what we do need to do for the little money that we spend there is very tangible, concrete, little projects, preferably focused on civil society uh, with clear objectives. And I hope that will uh, increase in the coming years. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your three very interesting interventions. There are clearly a lot of challenges in the region, but we have also learned that the EU has a role to play, even though they haven't kind of succeeded yet. So thank you very much also to the audience.